Thank you for joining us today to um, meet with Zoran Solano from Hot Property Specialists. Um, we are talking today about Brisbane units and your property goals. So thanks for giving up half an hour of your lunch break and hopefully we can uh, provide you with some useful information on uh, investing in Brisbane units. So uh, let me introduce to you Zoran. Um, he's a property expert and a buyer's agent here in Brisbane. He's recently purchased a unit uh, for us, which we're very happy with the result. Saved us an awful lot of time and I'm probably sure an awful lot of arguments as well, working out what we were um, going to purchase. So uh, over to you, uh, Zoran, and welcome and thank you for your time today. No worries. Thanks, Jack. <clears throat> well, uh, it's great to be here and have a bit of a chat about my passion, which is buying property. So, um, yeah, as you said, obviously, we've just recently purchased a unit for, um, for yourself personally. So I thought this would be a good opportunity for us to go over some uh, goal setting, um, how people can get themselves ready to buy. And, uh, and because, obviously, uh, your particular purchase was a unit, I thought talking about units today would be a good idea as well. So we'll go into some tips and tricks and things to look for when people are inspecting and wanting to buy a unit. Great. Thanks, Oren. Um, I'll just uh, fire some questions at you. And if, um, if anyone listening today has got uh, any questions, just type them into the control panel on the webinar, and uh, we'll get to those uh, throughout the, the presentation today. So. Zoran, what do you think the best way to go about establishing your individual property goals is? Well, look, everyone's different when it comes to buying property. And, um, and I guess a lot of our influences come from our environment, our parents, the experiences they had investing in property, whether they rented their whole life or whether they were um, you know, keen property investors. So people are going to be different um, in, in many different ways. Uh, one of the things that uh, I believe is you just need to assess your personal situation. And by personal situation, we're talking about uh, whether you are, for example, a first home buyer or you're looking to buy perhaps your first investment property um, in addition to your, maybe a PPR or principal place of residence that you currently own. So establishing that is, uh, is one of the first things. Obviously, if you're a first home buyer, there are some government incentives available with the first homeowners. Uh, uh, building boost grant for new new properties. Um, there's also a stamp duty concession as well, where uh, you have uh, no stamp duty depending on your purchase price. So those things you need to consider as well. Uh, for me, don't let uh, building boost grants and that kind of thing overly influence your purchase. It's obviously something you need to keep relevant, but uh, don't let it push you into purchasing just a brand new property because there is a big wide world of established real estate out there that people can take advantage of. Uh, one of the other things is obviously finance. How much money uh, do you have? What kind of deposit? Um, and what kind of serviceability do you have to be able to service a loan? So speaking with the finance broker or your bank to determine what your lending capability is and getting a formal pre-approval. Don't just let the bank say, you know what, you can have up to 600000 or a million dollars. Um, get a, a, a proper written pre-approval done up for you as an individual. Uh, one thing, uh, a tip that I would suggest to everyone, genuine savings is one of the biggest things for especially first home buyers. Uh, a lot of people are being gifted money um, or to, to help them purchase property. Banks need to see some money seeing your account for an extended period of time and need to see that you can save. So having genuine savings for a long period of time is very, very important. Uh, and recently I heard of a contract falling over because they just didn't have the genuine savings available to them. They could service the loan but they just didn't have the genuine savings. Uh, so, so those are a couple of points as well. Um, again, personal skill set. Um, if you've got a, uh, you know, perhaps a, a, a trade such as um, tiling or you're a carpenter, obviously you want to make use of those trades. So why buy something brand new? You know, consider renovation opportunities for you as well uh, and tie in the, uh, the first home uh, concessions that you get uh, perhaps to add value within that first 12 months of you residing in the property. So uh, that's, that's often a, a thing to, for people to consider as well. 
Great. So just on that genuine savings that you were, were talking about, will the banks will go through bank statements for the last sort of three to four months or, or even longer, do they, to just ensure there's no lump deposit or um, that you actually can save and not just squander it all so you will be able to service that debt? Correct. Yeah, I even experienced it in my last personal purchase um, where when I was going through the finance process, I had a number of um, transactions in and out of my account which exceeded the threshold, which I think was about $5,000, one of which was just simply when I actually sold my car. Um, uh, when uh, when I sold my vehicle, obviously I, I got the money from the sale and the bank wanted me to verify where that money had came from, whether it was uh, hopefully just not one of my family members giving me a, a quick little loan or something like that. So, yeah, look, it's definitely something people need to keep um, in the back of their mind. Uh, and, and, again, don't wait until you've found a property and put it under contract. Do all this ahead of time and make sure you have everything ready to go for when you identify the right property. Great, that's um, really useful, which probably um, kind of answers some of my next uh, question as well, is things to consider when setting a budget for the unit purchase. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add, what, what we should be, be looking at there when we're working out how much yeah. we can afford? Definitely, definitely. You need to look at the prolonged serviceability after you purchase um, a property as well. Um, I, I guess starting from the beginning, you need to have... Uh, Sufficient funds to pay for your legals, your bank uh, fees, if you have any bank fees payable when you have the mortgage set up. Um, you need to also consider, well, your stamp duty, uh, if that's applicable to you. Um, buyer's agent costs, if you're employing someone such as myself to do the work and, and do the searching and inspecting and negotiating. Um, and often as well, you're building in pest costs, your solicitor's searches. So all these things you need to be aware of over and above just the, uh, the the cash deposit you need for the deposit of the, the, the purchase. So those are some extra costs to be looking at as well. And I guess they're the, the hidden costs that you don't initially look at when you're looking at uh, what a property is um, is being listed at. Um, so, And I can certainly yeah. also say that that buyer's agent fee was well worth it on our, on our behalf too, and uh, money, money well spent there. Yeah, definitely. Um, what about, um, well, that's, that's great with the financing side of things. Now, what about different unit styles? I know here in Brisbane there's new units, there's older units, there's ones that need a lot of uh, renovation, and there's, there's older ones that are good to rent out straight away. What are, what are, can you tell me a little bit about the different unit styles and the pros and cons of them? <clears throat> yeah, I guess what I'll firstly cover is the difference between units and apartments. Um, a lot of people don't understand the difference. Now, apartments are generally in larger complexes with additional facilities such as your pool, gym, sauna, um, lift, those kind of things. We generally see them within a close proximity of the CBD um, and, and they're generally a high-rise configuration. Um, units, on the other hand, smaller walk-up style complexes, uh, no lift, no pool, no gym, lower body corporates in more boutique um, establishments. So. Traditionally, we purchase more units than apartments. Um, it really goes back to, I guess, the core of what we're looking for when we're buying properties is quality investment opportunities with long-term capital growth and, uh, and good returns as well. And we often find those larger complexes have very high body corporates, four, five, six thousand dollars per year is not unheard of. And at the end of the day, you're paying for uh, amenities that no one is really using. You as an investor don't get to go down to the swimming pool just because you own the property. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, that's something you need to take into consideration. Does it increase your rental? Well, look, then we've got another sign of it where overpopulation and saturation into the rental market in these larger complexes comes into play. So although there's better um, amenity within the, your own complex, there's then a larger cross-section of properties available at that time competing for tenants. So uh, so generally we focus on smaller, more boutique-style uh, units, um, such as what we uh, purchased for yourself. Great, yes, which was just a one unit in a six complex which with low body corps, so that um, will work out well, I think. Great. I didn't understand that difference between units and apartments, or I, I guess I did, but I didn't understand the that the, the distinction that I was probably using them uh, interchangeably, those two terms. So mm. useful. Okay. 
What about older units? Um, there's there's a few older units out there. Is there anything in particular that uh, we should be looking for when inspecting those to make sure that they fit in with our investment um, objectives? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, older units, I would definitely say there's great opportunities in older unit complexes, especially if you've got um, someone that you know or you personally have a skill set to uh, undertake some renovations. Or if, even if not, you can still obtain um, advice and help from, from others in doing those renovations. Um, so, uh, so don't be scared off by adding a little bit of value to a property or spending a little bit of money. Um, I, again, it's going to come down to your individual criteria. If you need something that straight off the bat is high yielding with a bit of depreciation, and you don't have the available funds to do a renovation, then buying something already renovated or a little bit newer or relatively new. Um, so when I say relatively new, I'm looking at properties that are built probably after 1990, so in the 90s and the 2000s, um, is generally considered relatively new. Uh, the, the, the construction methods really changed a lot in the late 80s. Um, uh, materials changed, building codes, that kind of thing. So uh, it's uh, th those sort of properties are generally considered uh, to be still quite modern. They're starting to date a little bit in their kitchens and bathrooms, so that's an opportunity for people to add value um, to the properties. So I'll go through here. I've got a slideshow here with just a few quick slides with some examples of things that I look for, um, especially in older units when purchasing. Um, uh, one of the, the most important things is the size of the units. Uh, for example, in older 1960s, 1970s style complexes, uh, back in those days, the internal and external area all made up GFA, which is gross floor area. So when developers were undertaking developments, the outside area was included in the, the, the uh, footprint of the property as well. So in this example, I've got an older complex this is a two-bed, one-bath, one-car property. This is an uh, extract from the building unit plan, um, which displays the exclusive use areas for that particular property. So again, we've got common property, which is uh, looked after by the strata and by the, uh, the, the uh, managing agent uh, involved, the body corporate. Um, and then you've got what's within your property, uh, which is your responsibility. Now here, unit four is indicated in red, to the left-hand side of the screen, you've got the car park, which, as it says, is part of uh, the total property. That's the garage there. So a, a good thing we like about this is uh, at 35 square metres, it's, uh, it's one of the larger car parks available in this complex, which is good. It's also positioned to the end of the complex, which is also good, helping for turning in and out. These are all the things we think of when we're looking at properties, is, is how livable is it uh, when people are living in this, uh, in, in this property. So uh, also, if we go to the right-hand side of the screen here, you can see the unit itself. You've got the duct here, this little square, which is actually where your services run down, and your sewer and your water, and then your patio or your balcony. Now, you'll see that the patio is included in the 83 square metres indicated for the size of this unit. Now, I'll tell you why that's really important to note when you're investigating units, especially when you're looking at one-bedroom one units closer to the CBD. A lot of banks and financiers, when you're loaning up to 80% uh, or greater than 80%, 90 or 95% LVR or loan-to-value ratio, uh, banks will need to have a lender's mortgage insurer um, involved, and, and that's not to insure yourself but the bank against the liability of that property. Now, for this instance, obviously it's a, it's a larger unit, but let's imagine that this is a one-bedroom unit, and instead of 83 square metres, uh, it says here 53 square metres. Now, when looking at the property itself, as I said, you can see the balcony is included in this area. Some lenders, mortgage insurers, would like the unit to be 50 or larger square metres internally. So if this was 53 square metres, we then have to subtract the area of the balcony. In this case, it's probably going to be uh, probably around seven or eight square metres, that balcony, let's assume. So it drops us down below 50 square metres. So let's look at this situation. This is why you need to do your homework up front. If this property was going to auction, for example, you have formal pre-approval to purchase a unit, 
and the prerequisites are that it's got to be 50 square metres and you go along and you see it says 53 square metres so you're really, really happy and you turn up on auction day, you bid and you're successful. The bank sends its valuer out who with his little measuring device measures the internal square meterage and finds it's below 50 square metres and that uh, unfortunately you need to come up with either 20% deposit uh, or you need to uh, find another way to, to continue with the purchase. Again, some people can't come up with those kind of funds, so often what we would see if that situation did arise is that the contract would unfortunately fall over. At, at auction, that's a big deal because it's a cash unconditional situation, so, uh, so you could be in a, a world of trouble in that instance. So again, by having the appropriate uh, research done up front, but then also having in a uh, negotiation by private treaty, if you're putting the property under contract, having the appropriate special conditions to protect you and have finance uh, as one of the special conditions is very important. Now, if we go on to the next issue, these are a few building and pest items just briefly that we encounter. A lot of these are not massive deal breakers, but when inspecting a property, you should make yourself aware of these kind of issues and look at the property with your eyes wide open and not with, uh, with rose-coloured glasses. So in this instance, in this photo, you can see this is an um, air conditioning overflow. Uh, one of the telltale things that will come up in your building and pest will be, be that the water discharging to the base of the foundations is not ideal. So that's something that's going to come up. Also to the right-hand side, you can see a join between two slabs. Again, this is body corporate. These can form trip hazards. Uh, and again, it's something very minor, but it comes up in building and pests, and people often get scared of these things. That's a body corporate issue. Um, if you have the property tenanted and someone trips, there can be a liability. So these things you need to be aware of and add to the ongoing maintenance of the body corporate. And again, when assessing a property's um, suitability to your property goals, you want to be assessing the, uh, the, the sinking fund balance. When, when, you, when you're a part of strata, there will be a sinking fund for maintenance and repairs to common areas such as these. You want to make sure there is a plan in place to, uh, to deal with these issues that are coming up, but then also uh, you want to make sure there's sufficient funds in there and that you won't have to be digging into your pocket every couple of months. The next issue here I often see, especially in older complexes, it is evidence of movement within the complex itself. So this particular instance, you can see a crack which follows the line of the, uh, of the brickwork here between the bricks. Um, that, that, that is a telltale sign of a bit of movement in that complex. Again, a lot of properties move over their 30, 40 years of being, uh, being built, um, some of which is more severe than others. So again, your building and pest inspector will give you some more feedback on that. But from a preliminary point of view, if you see cracking thicker than this, this is very fine cracking. To be honest, this wouldn't concern me at an initial point. But if that cracking was very, very predominant and it was all around the building, in each corner, corners are the particular points that often show this, and around window frames, if this was everywhere, I'd be very, very concerned. Um, I'd be very, very concerned. Sorry, I just uh, jumped out of my screen there. Let me just organise that back for you. So those are a few uh, bits and pieces for you to look at as well when inspecting properties and, and, and uh, wanting to assess properties case by case, things to look for in older units. As I touched on as well, you want to be keeping in those smaller boutique complexes, which these older units um, typically are in. Great, that's um, that's useful. And to know that um, cracking like that, I would look at it and go, well, is it serious or, or is it not? And I guess um, to have someone like yourself to come and ask and go, where do we go from here to find out um, if this is a problem or, or it's a showstopper show for the contract or not. So that's mm. useful. Thank you, Zoran. Um, just uh, if anyone's got any questions to ask, please just type that into your box and I'll come to question uh, time in a minute. Um, did you have uh, anything else to add that you thought our viewers would, would be interested in today, Zoran? Yeah, definitely. I've got a few case studies of units and uh, apartments that we've purchased recently, so I'll just flick through those um, as some of those questions maybe come through. Uh, so I'll give you an example. This is a unit that we very, very recently purchased. It's only just settled. Two bed, two bath, one car, 
five-year-old complex, again, we didn't buy brand new because buying brand new, often you're paying a premium for those new properties. It's just like a new car. As soon as you drive out of the complex, uh, the value drops. Essentially, this often happens with units uh, and houses as well. So buying established, there's still good depreciation. Um, in this instance, you'll see that the uh, gross rental returns a little bit wide on. It's a 395. Uh, the tenants were existing tenants, and when negotiating the contract, um, we also included an increase in rental being offered to the tenants on a fixed term agreement up to the 410 per week to try and increase those uh, returns for our clients as well. Again, this complex has body corporates around the 2,200 per annum, very, very low. Um, uh, the client's goals were to purchase a sub $500,000 unit. We paid 435, so you can see well within their budget. Uh, around seven or eight k's from the Brisbane CBD in a nice quiet location in Blue Chip Clayfield. So that's a great example. Um, Mount Cravat East, uh, again, this is a, your typical 1970s style complex with a renovated unit, two bed, one bath, one car, uh, purchased for 360, rented for 330. Uh, the owners actually rented it back at 330 uh, because they hadn't found another property to move to. So in this instance, the rental's slightly lower but, but we don't have any downtime whatsoever, and we know that uh, the the owners are going to ho hopefully look after the property. Given a with a good property manager, it's very very important that we do an entry condition report to maintain um, and ensure that uh, the property is given back to us in the same condition that we gave it to our tenants. And in this instance, uh, there's a high likelihood of that. Obviously, homeowners are still very house proud, and you can see the condition of the unit. Um, was very, very good as well. Moving forward, uh, this particular property uh, will be able to uh, be rented out to the open market after their six-month lease is, uh, is up. Here's another example we purchased. Uh, this was this client's very first purchase with us. Uh, two bed, one bath, one car, massive balcony in Annerley, uh, paid three seventy dollars a week, currently being advertised for three sixty dollars per week uh, for rent. Great outlook. Um, a very, very large unit. One of the, the biggest two-bedroom units I think we've purchased in a very long time. And this last one is a little bit outside the scope we typically use. This is an apartment. Um, this was purchased for an investor who in the medium to long term would look to reside in the property themselves. So we had a mix of property investment goals, but also some personal goals for that client as well. So we bought, sorry, there's a typo there. It's actually a two-bedroom unit, two-bed, two-bath, Two car, two secure car in Paddington, it's very, very important. There is limited street parking in those locations, so having the two car widens the demographic for future sale and also rental. This unit's returning approximately 5.2% gross return straight away. We purchased 620, I purchased it for 627,000 uh, and it's rented for 640 per week. In this instance, we had a special condition on the contract which enabled us to start marketing and showing the property for rent prior to settlement. And what that meant is uh, in the two or three weeks prior to settlement but after unconditional, we could start showing tenants through and trying to achieve the top end of the rental range um, from our initial rental assessments, which was the 640 per week. We achieved that. This property settled on a Friday. The following Friday, we had tenants straight in there paying 640 a week. Um, in this instance, we had two young couples uh, being a two-bed, two-bath and split over two levels. The configuration was perfect for two couples sharing. Uh, so we've got four full-time employed people, young people hardly ever in the unit themselves. They're obviously all full-time working uh, or in their early 20s doing what they do. Uh, and the two-car was the main uh, selling factor, if you want to put it that way, of why these tenants chose our property over in fact, the, the, the unit directly next door, which was being advertised for six twenty a week, uh, and it was a single car accommodation. So, car accommodation can be very, very important as well. So, that looks uh, like it. And, and finally, uh, I believe this is our last one here: Gordon Park Self Managed Super Fund purchase, uh, three eighty five purchase price, rented for three seventy a week. We ended up achieving three seventy a week. Um, again, a very, very big unit, fully renovated in Gordon Park, just a couple of k's out from the CBD. Great. Oh, we've got another one. Green slopes. <laughs> so were there any questions coming through?
Yeah, there's there's one question here. Um, so as part of your buyer's agent service, do you you find the property, and is that where your role finishes, or or what? What do you provide? You find the property, you get it under contract. Do you provide additional services to to sort it out and get it through that unconditional phase to that unconditional phase? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, our service is very, very comprehensive from establishing your property goals, searching and inspecting properties that suit your goals, and then once that that property is found, undertaking a comprehensive recommendation with photos, videos, uh, inspection reports. Um, detail on the, the, the location and the surrounding area, price and rental returns, and uh, negotiating the contracts, uh, putting it under contract, facilitating the contract through to settlement, and um, with our property management services as well, hopefully uh, helping our clients with the ongoing management um, of that property as well. So, um, yeah, it's a very comprehensive service. Great. Okay. I hope that answers uh, that question. Um, there's another one here from, from an out-of-town uh, viewer. You'll, you'll deal with people from out-of-town, and I guess that's where um, you can really bring in your um, expertise on the Brisbane market. For, if you've got people from Sydney or Melbourne wanting to buy here in Brisbane, um, you'll mm -hmm. work with them right through the process. How does that work? Yeah, look, it works exactly the same as, as, as a, a local person. Um, it's uh, uh, predominantly the communication happens via phone or uh, via emails or Skype. Um, we don't physically meet a lot of our clients because they are interstate overseas clients um, or just very time poor. So uh, communication is predominantly done via the internet. Um, and uh, the, the process is very similar. Again, we do all the legwork, all the inspections. When we recommend a property that we believe is suitable, um, all the information is sent via email. Uh, and um, some clients uh, don't ever physically see the properties we purchase for them. Some will fly up once we have a property secured under contract for them to come in and take a look at themselves. But, uh, but usually uh, people only want to inspect it just for the sake of inspecting it. Um, we, we have a very, very comprehensive recommendation pro, uh, uh, um, procedure which uh, people often find out enough about the property through our recommendation. Um, we take a lot of photos. 30, 40, 50 photos of any one property showing the good and the not so good. So every client knows what they're getting themselves into um, prior to us putting the property under contract. So they're very much aware of the condition and the, uh, the price and the returns that are expected. Great. So they can do all their research from their, from their office at home and uh, take your word on doing do you do all the legwork, which is, is great. Okay. Mm. That answered that question. Well, we might wrap that up here. We're... we're um, just coming up to a half hour now, so we don't want to take up any more time than, um, than you've given us. So thank you so much for your time, Zoran, and thank you for everyone for attending. I do hope that was, uh, was useful and put some, uh, some ideas and thoughts into your head about, um, about Brisbane units and how if that would fit in with your, your property goals. Thanks, everyone, and have a great afternoon.